Hey, what's up, guys? It is Dan from FireWave, and today I'm joined by somebody who I'll be talking to for the second time for an interview. And today I'm excited to talk to him because last time we talked, we covered all the bases, you know, we just were able to have a really good conversation. And, you know, it's nothing different. The last time we spoke, we I had not seen him fight live. And at my first UFC event, UFC San Diego, I was lucky enough to cash in on a parlay, the GM3 sub. You know the vibes, guys. You know, uh, like OG Mac, like OG Shawnee Mac likes to say, the Jits nerds. Uh, you know, GM3, nothing but good vibes. You know, a, fan, a man of the people, a man of giving the people the fights that they want. And fights nothing but killers. I swear to God, the UFC is trying to, to get this guy, you know, out of the UFC. It feels like they're trying to get him out of the UFC, but he's, you know, the gift that just keeps on giving. Today, I'm joined by my brother, Gerald Mearshot. How are we doing today? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you, man? Man, not too bad, not too bad, Gerald. I was happy to watch you fight at UFC San Diego live, you know. Uh, first and foremost, thank you. Got to send you some money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I made like 10, 10, 15 bucks off the off the GM3 sub. As always, you know, you bring nothing but great fights, brother. And, you know, it was a blast and honor to watch you do your do your thing live. Talk to me first and foremost about how's life, how's everything been, and just what's uh, good in the life of Gerald Merchard. Uh, everything's been going pretty good. Um, I'm down in Florida full time now. I relocated so I could train at Killcliffe full time and just be a little more active, be able to take shorter notice fights like I've done so many times in the past. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to be here year round and, you know, make the, uh, this part of my career the best part. No, yeah, absolutely. And I know last time we spoke, you were going in between Wisconsin and, uh, Florida, but now... So you've obviously just made the move to Florida full time. Talk to me about obviously like the last time we spoke, it was Sanford still. Uh, now it's Killcliffe. Feel, and then it was originally Black Zillions. Then it went to Sanford. Then it went to Killcliffe. A uh, ton of name changes. But talk to me just about obviously uh, the vibes around the gym right now. It's at an all time high momentum. Everyone's fighting. Everyone's active. You know, it's just a great time to be training at Killcliffe. How's the energy been? Uh, it's been good. I mean, you know, it's. It's a really big team, like you said. There's a lot of really high high level performers across all the major organizations. Um, you know, like any team, we've had some really good, really good weekends. We've had some rough weekends, and uh, there've been more definitely since I've been. You know, by very limited time, I've seen it's definitely more good weekends and bad weekends, which is always nice. But you know, the the common theme is the team always comes together, and we always come together as a group to get better. You know what I mean? The the answer is stay dedicated in the gym, you know, build our skill set together and like high tide raises all ships. If we can all keep improving, we'll all keep doing get better and we'll, you know, we'll be a household name for years to come. No, yeah, absolutely. And what J- coach Jason Stout and Henry Hooft have been developing and building at coach at, at team kill cliff FC in Florida. It's been remarkable to see the journey and the evolution of the gym, you know, you talk about just from that 155 to 170 pound division to the 185 division alone. You guys have got so many quality bodies. You know, just that lightweight Michael Chandler, Christos Yagos, Evan Elder. You know, Michael Johnson, and then you got at once at 170 Ian Gary, Shafkat, Gilbert Burns. You know, the list goes on and on of quality bodies and training partners at Kill Cliff. And you know, at a time where now Florida is recognized as the MMA hotbed and like a premier destination for people to bring their career, bring their families and bring their lifestyle to down to Florida and really immerse themselves in MMA full time. And, you know, Gerald, for you, I feel like, like I said at the beginning, the UFC has been doing you dirty, man, with these matchups, dude, they've been giving you killers after killers. And it's been, you've been fighting probably the best on like of all the unranked middleweights, everyone wants to avoid. You've been fighting every single one of them and you've been beating and you've been beating a lot of them, you know, and it's just, it's remarkable because I feel like, uh, at this stage, at, at this stage in your career, and throughout your entire career, people have counted you out, but you've always came back and shut them up, and or you've done something where you're like, put some, like you guys have got to put a little bit of respect on what I've been doing and and my career as a whole. You know, I'm not just coming in here and uh, fighting nobody's. You know, I'm fighting the best in the world consistently and on a consistent basis. And you know, it's no different. You know, you I, I feel like now they're they're maybe doing it dirty with the back to back Philly matchup. You know, going from fighting Joe Pfeiffer to Andre Petrovsky to uh, teammates, but you know, you're it's still the proof is in the pudding. You continue to fight the best in the world. What are what are your thoughts on the matchups you've been getting and just being able to prove the doubters wrong and obviously make a statement in the middleweight division? Uh, well, 
the first thing would be like I, I definitely take all comers. Uh, I'm kind of known for that, and you know, like you've been saying, if you look at my track record, it's pretty self-evident. That being said, if you're in the UFC, it's kind of hard not to fight killers all the time. You know what I mean? I mean, there's definitely people uh, that we've seen be built up that maybe, you know, you could argue get more favorable matchups. But uh, middleweight, especially when I first came in, it wasn't that deep of a division. Now there's definitely, like, not only is it deep, but there's kind of a gridlock, right? Because we had Israel Adesanya kind of go through most of the division. And then he had his uh, trilogy with um, Pahea. So that was taking up a lot of time. Uh, and Robert Whitaker's always in the wings. And then you got the you know, the Marvin Vittori's that have been around for a while. They're just kind of waiting in the wings, the Paulo Costas and stuff like that. So during all this going on, we've had a lot of up-and-comers and, like, blue-chip prospects. And I've been fighting most of them. <laughs> and I feel like I beat you know, enough of them and I give enough exciting fights. The UFC keeps me around. I've got my own little, you know, fan base going. And I think people really appreciate that about me. Um, but it's like, uh, I beat enough of them that I get some respect, but I haven't, uh, I've lost enough times, I guess, where, uh, there's not really the allure, I guess you could say of like anyone considering me a contender right now, which I understand you got to be consistent in this sport. So that's one big thing, but you know, I I can't imagine getting to the UFC and not fighting everybody. A lot of guys say they will, but it's a different thing to do it. And you know, if I'm going to get to the top, I'm going to get to the top. It's you know, taking a certain route isn't going to make a difference because eventually you're going to have to fight everybody anyway. So why not do it now? No, yeah, absolutely. I love what you mentioned there. It's like if you're coming into the UFC, you got to be prepared to fight anyone, anytime, anywhere. And obviously, like you mentioned, there's some guys the UFC is kind of safeguarding or kind of protecting for a little while, uh, or at least it seems that way. But then there's the guys who are fighting all comers like yourself, fighting anyone that comes in their path. And I feel like, like you said, it's just the consistency part of it. But even then, you've beaten some of the biggest middleweights, you know, uh, in the world. You know, Bruno Silva, Mahmoud Muradov, just two names in recent memory that come to mind, you know. Those are no like those are like solid middleweight prospects, and you came in and completely silenced the doubters and everyone in the in the path. And you know, right now, looking at that middleweight division, it's wide open for the taking. You know, you look at Ikram Alaskarov, you look at Abu Magomedov, two guys coming off one victory, both of them being stellar victories, getting handed. You know, or not getting handed, but being provided with you know a big matchup in the middleweight division. Both of them fighting, you know, in the top six, seven opponents. And right now, we're seeing the middleweight division, like you mentioned, in some sort of a gridlock where everyone's either already fought Whitaker or fought Adesanya, and they just need to get some new blood in there desperately to keep the division moving and keep it fresh. You know, right now, there's that also, but also in your, you know, personal interest in your first love of jiu-jitsu, you know, Fury Grappling has been doing an amazing thing with, you know, just having all sorts of people grapple, uh, all sorts of grappling matchups, all sorts of fun stylistic matchups. You know, you, you fought Joe in the UFC, and then you grapple with Joe on Fury on Fury Grappling. Talk to me about just, obviously, uh, your thoughts on Fury Grappling and how far the sport of jiu-jitsu has come. You know, 1FC completely going on an absolute tear with the jiu-jitsu division right now. You know, we see Cade Rotolo staying active in competition on a regular basis. Rainier de Ritter, you know, Ty Rotolo. It just, it's, it's been a remarkable journey for jiu-jitsu. Talk to me about your thoughts on that and being able to be a part of this historic rise. Yeah, it's really interesting, and and Nogi specifically has definitely been at the forefront, and like the guys you just named off, um, you know, the Rotolo brothers being very well known in just the Nogi community, and uh, De Ritter's, you know, one FC championship. He's a, a mixed martial artist, and he's using it very very well. Um, so it's really good to see. There's always, you know, ebbs and flows as far as like, uh, are the wrestlers at the top? Are the strikers at the top? Are the jujitsu guys at the top? Is it a hybrid? Uh, is it a Sambo guy? You know what I mean? So it's always cool to see everyone kind of looks at what's winning right now. And then some people will try to mimic that, you know, with some success. But a lot of guys will go, OK, that's winning for that demographic. Let me go take what I do and figure out a way to beat that so I can get back on top. And that's a really cool, like kind of race to see. And now as it keeps progressing, even the guys, you know, like a Deritter that you mentioned, it's not like the old school hoist grace here, like even me, where I'm just going out there pulling guard. It's like we're truly seeing the evolution to at a certain point. Everyone's always going to be a little bit better at something, 
but it's all going to look very, very similar, and it's going to be more dictated by athletic ability and uh, body type rather than, you know, stylistic what they're good at. You know what I'm saying? So that's a really cool thing to be a part of. Uh, Cage Fury was fun. I had a lot of fun grappling on it. Um, you know, it's definitely not like a normal jiu-jitsu competition. Uh, it favors a little more wrestling, and there's not a point system, which, you know, it's not – not great it's not bad either it's fun it's fun for the fans that's what it's meant to be uh, i'd love to do it again i'd really like to get on that ufc invitational the nogi grappling that's more like a, a true grappling competition so to speak but the the cage fury is a great thing to see keeping ufc fighters and other people that are known in nogi active and competing against each other and their peers and like just another uh another thing to kind of like shed light on another combat sport and kind of like give everybody like a fun out of season competition. You know what I mean? Kind of like a, a summer NBA basketball league, if you will. I was going to say, no, yeah, definitely. And I love that example, you know, first and foremost, like it just gives something for everyone. I know there's a lot of fans who just love the grappling aspect of MMA and they want as much of that content and that combat sports footage to consume. So I love what the UFC uh, fight pass is done having more grappling oriented events you know the fury grappling invitational just having these different events that we can cater to all sorts of fans and really just bringing shedding light to jiu-jitsu you know i feel like obviously we have a lot of different promotions for muay thai for kickboxing and for different fighting and striking disciplines but jiu-jitsu was kind of always you know it was either adcc or its own standalone thing but i loved the ufc is integrating it into its fight pass and into its daily kind of operations as functioning as a overall overseer of the entire combat sports community. And it's just something cool for me to, to kind of shed light on, you know, seeing as though it's just the evolution of how it's being covered is, is changing right in front of our very eyes. And I think that what you've kind of done for the jiu-jitsu community in mixed martial arts you know, I, I mentioned it at the beginning and I think, you know, shout out to Sean and what, and, you know, your friendship with him. He's a great guy. You know, the Jits nerds being done, the Jits nerds uh, kind of thing, you know, from by OG. Um, talk to me just about uh, what it's meant for you to have the fan base kind of rally behind you. Like you mentioned, kind of getting your sort of own niche community of supporters because of the of the reputation you've built for yourself and and having that fan base that supports you win or lose, you know. Oftentimes fighters lose and the fan base turns on them or shits on them and I think it's bad But you having that fan base that more or less gets behind you even in win victory or defeat. What does it mean to you? Uh, it's pretty awesome, you know, I'm not gonna lie like it's uh, I definitely uh, I fight for you know me and I love doing it and no matter if I was getting paid the way I am and in the UFC or doing whatever, like obviously I wouldn't be able to dedicate my life to it the way I have. Right. But I would always be doing it in some capacity. Like I truly love it, but it's, it's really cool to have the fans that I do because I definitely, uh, you know, I understand what you're talking about because like I'll, I don't have maybe the biggest fan base, you know what I mean? Like hardcore fan base. There are some guys that are like, you know, like they get a certain pop or when they're on a hot streak, like, you know, people are going crazy for them. But I think it's kind of endearing. Cause like, I don't, I, I truly don't think I have any bandwagon fans. I either have people that like kind of respect me or like my true fan base. They're there no matter what they're there, ride or die. And, uh, I had one of my good buddies, uh, that I finally got to meet in person. You guys know him on Twitter is booger beard, but he, he gave me a very nice compliment and something that I think, uh, you know, really rang true to me and I guess made a lot of sense as he was like, I think people, you know, tend to gravitate towards you and like your fighting style so much is because you always have to overcome adversity. And a lot of people can see themselves in that, you know what I mean? So it's like none of my fights, you know, even the Bruno Silva one, you could argue that's the best I've looked in like maybe the my most dominant win. But even that one, there were still a lot of people that said like, uh, you know, felt like I was in danger that, you know, I wasn't quite running away with the fight the way I thought I was, but you know, 90% of my fights, it's a fight. You know what I mean? They're, I'm going to put myself in a position where it's kill or be killed. Uh, and a lot of times I got to fight myself out of a hole. And I think, you know, people have come to enjoy that, expect that. And like I said, they can see themselves in that because for most people, it's not that easy, right? You wake up, you go to work every day. Life is a struggle, 
and they get to see that struggle play out in real life right in front of them and you know hopefully they feel like they see like you know uh i'm not uh i'm definitely a professional athlete i stay in good shape right but i, I don't look ridiculous like some of these guys uh so you know you can tell i pass the eye test and the usada test every time with flying colors and they're like you know maybe if this guy who's you know looks like a normal guy from the midwest can get in there uh, you know he can put his chin down put his fists up and go to work and like fight through whatever comes his way and you know they identify with that like i can do that too and hopefully that helps people and you know i think that's what keeps my fan base so strong and I love what you mentioned there is like that that idea of tying the parallel between people's personal life and the way you fight and having that adversity to overcome and always, you know, for the most part coming through. It speaks volumes about just the the willpower and grit that you have in that octagon. And I think that grit is something that never goes unnoticed. You know, like you see Dustin Poirier always like people say you can't outgrid Dustin Poirier. That's a guy that, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. He just goes in there, puts it all down, and it's like it's do or die for him in that octagon. And I feel like we see a lot of that in you, that do or die nature. Like if I, it's either lights out or night out. Like it's whatever, by any means necessary, we see you giving it your all. And I feel like it's very endearing to the fans who maybe, you know, like you said, we don't know what other people go through personally. But having that physical kind of living proof for something that you can get through adversity in, in a combat sports format and maybe that pays, plays parallels or meta, is metaphoric to you know the life that people are living it's it's very you know something you gravitate towards and i think just in terms of your style gerald like no no easy fights always fighting with that kind of chip on your shoulder of proving the doubters wrong and and not not literally like oh you know, you think that but like i feel like it's just more or less like the style that comes with it, everyone counting you out or you coming back and proving them wrong by giving off a spectacular performance. It speaks volumes about your character and what you provide to this sport in terms of just being a great combatant. And, you know, with the momentum right now that you're on, even despite a loss, you know, I think that you're still one of the best middleweights in the world. And, you know, one in this division right now, one or two fight away, maybe after the Petrovsky fight, a top 15 opponent away. Talk to me about, obviously... Assuming you get to Petrovsky, is there any personal goals or fighting goals or any goals in particular that you want to maybe get now that we're halfway through 2023? Uh, I, would, I would definitely like to fight, get this fight in August and fight one more time before the year is over. Um, you know, see how this fight goes as long as I'm not injured and I, I do as well as I think I can. Hopefully I can get a ranked opponent. If not, you know... I'm sure I'll get another Russian prospect or something like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is, hey, that's fine, too. It's it's my job to keep winning fights, and that's, you know, uh, like you said before, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily counted out, but I do see a lot of, like, uh, almost every time I get a fight, I'll, you know, I try not to watch them after I lose because I think that, that would just be too frustrating, but after I win, I'll go back and see all, like, the odds makers' videos. And pretty much every time, even if they think I'm going to win, they're like, yeah, he might win, he might not, but there's a good chance he gets knocked out. Like, everyone thinks, like, since the Hamza fight, like, that I'm just going to get touched and, like, that's, it's going to be lights out. Like, I have no chin all of a sudden. And, like, obviously my last fight doesn't help that case. And there was a lot of, you know, different factors that kind of, like, did not help that. But, you know, I fought a, a young, strong, explosive kid and I got caught. And, like, sometimes that happens. You know what I mean? It's, it's fighting. If you fight enough people, you fight a lot as long as I've had, but then you're kind of, you know, people, and I've seen some articles too, like, Oh, he's lost, uh, two of the last three. It's like, yeah, I lost to a guy that all of you think is like the next coming of Jesus. And then I lost to Jocko, who's a perennial top 15 guy. And I had a bad night. Other than that, I've won a lot of fights and I beat a guy who went the distance with Pahea and Pahea couldn't drop him. And it wasn't a fluke because he came back after he fought me and he beat a very, very tough opponent who's also usually ranked in the top 15, who's also now fighting one of my very good friends and training partners, Brendan Allen, who's ranked in the top 10. I don't know how that makes sense either, but you know what I mean? I, I, I get you know paid well, I get to do what I love, and I know that if I keep winning consistently, and that's on me no matter what, if I win consistently, I'll get to achieve the goals I want to achieve. Sure. And, uh, you know, I definitely want to fight a ranked opponent. I definitely want to fight for a title, you know, in the not too distant future. And like, 
certain ones of those are like a little farther off than others. And I, you know, I want to be able to say my 50 fights, I think I can hit 60 fights before I retire. That would be like a, another cool thing too. So there's definitely some like short term and long term goals. Um, you know, a lot of people I'm sure will hear me saying like, Oh, like that guy's never going to fight for a title, but it's like, you know, every time you guys think I'm going to lose, you know, usually I pull, pull through, you know what I'm saying? Like I've always found a way to win. I've always made adjustments uh, even being a more seasoned and like not the youngest guy on the UFC roster, I can always find a way to win. And stranger things have happened. So you know, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Absolutely. And I mean, first and foremost, like you said, the the kind of head scratching that Bruno Silva got that opponent just a little bit. But you know, like I don't. I thought I would have thought after the Tavares fight, maybe. Uh, or after the, your fight, you would have gotten a ranked opponent. But not, nonetheless, like you said, just you keep kind of breaking down these barriers and shutting people up more or less. And it's just funny to, to see how quick people change their perspectives on a fighter. Like after the Hamza fight, you know, like you said, people looking at you as like tainted meat. Then you come back and shut everyone up with the Muradov performance, with the, all the, with the, all the other performances. And time and time again, you've shown that like you can never truly count a fighter out. It's, it's literally anything can happen in that octagon. And any fighter can come back from a devastating loss and look as as good as they have in, you know, recent years. And I thank you so much for your time, Gerald. You know, it's always nice to sit and speak with you. Last time was a blast and this time was no different. You know, a man of the people in every sense of the word. And I have no doubt. And for me, particularly, I'm eyeing that matchup of Weidman and Tavares. And I really want to see you fight the winner of that fight. I mean, imagine just the legacy matchup that it would be. Uh, Chris Weidman versus Gerald Mershaw, you're now two long-standing middleweights and pioneers of the division going at it head to head to tail, and it'd just be remarkable to see, in my opinion. That's just what I want to see as a fan, but, you know, regardless, thank you so much for your time, for your good energy, and to the fans at home watching, go check out Gerald on social media. One of the best fighters, one of the best and nicest fighters in the community, always a man of the people, always a man of the community members. And just, you know, one of the nicest guys all around. Do be sure to check him out on social media. It's been me, Dan, from Fight Wave, guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this interview. Do be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And have a great day, guys.